good morning and good afternoon. Our next guest is Dr. Christopher Liu. He is an MD and a PhD, and I'm going to do a quick screenshot of his books here. We're speaking with author and uh, speaker and writer and physician and really entrepreneur and a docpreneur in uh, so many ways. He's written How I Quit My Lucrative uh, Medical Career, uh, and achieved financial freedom using real estate. Uh, we have here the Physician's Guide to Financial Freedom, uh, Getting Started as a Consultant, Financial Physician's Guide to Achieving Financial Freedom Using Stocks and Options, How I Became Financially Free Using a Three Simple Step Stock Investing Process, and a Physician's Guide to Financial Freedom, Becoming a Freelance Writer. So Dr. Christopher Liu, thanks for being with us today. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me on this uh, series. Absolutely. So today's uh, the third part in our series together. And today we're going to talk about looking at the various non-clinical options uh, to help a physician uh, add revenue to their, um, their life, their lifestyle, their bank account, their retirement. Uh, this is really geared towards all ages, all physicians, uh, in specialties. And I would even say if we have some nurse practitioners, PAs, RNs, we want to be inclusive of them as well. I think that this is something that is geared towards uh, them as well. Coming out of medical school, you have this crushing debt. And, um, you know, if we have seen in, in the course of the last couple of years, um, well, the last couple few decades, bureaucracy increase in a physician's job, and you didn't sign up for that. Uh, we've also seen, you know, doctors' practices close um, within the last couple of years. We see burnout on the rise. We see patient fatigue on the rise. There's patients you know, you're like, oh, man. <laughs> They're coming in today. So, uh, Dr. Liu, thanks for joining us. We're going to talk about some of those non-clinical options for revenue that doctors and healthcare providers should lean in and learn about. Yeah, definitely. I'm excited and I'm excited to talk about the various different options for physicians and um, as a side stream or to replace your income. So, um, and there's just, it's, there's so many different opportunities. Absolutely. So let's uh, go ahead and, and just kick it off. Um, let's talk about number one on your list. Yeah. So um, uh, one, the first thing is uh, I think physicians, they have a really great platform because they, they're taking care of patients and um, you know, they're looked at as um, uh, status figures in society. So they're looked up and then they, they have a lot of um, uh, social and brand value. So they can, physicians can utilize this for a lot of different things um, to help others and to um, also start side businesses and that sort of thing. So the first thing is, um, is uh, one is consulting. So, and consulting is a really broad term. It's a really general term, but it's essentially um, where you're marketing and, and advertising your niche products and services for a you know, specific use. Uh, it's highly uh, flexible. It can be highly lucrative. It can, it's also highly creative and also highly rewarding. So a lot of physicians um, either early on or at the end of their career, if they're looking at, at transitioning, consulting is a um, great way to do that. And there's a lot of different uh, uh, niche consulting markets. So, um, you know, in medical education, writing, speaking, uh, healthcare, IT, uh, supply chain management, billing, coding. Uh, so there's a whole host of um, niches within that. Uh, the other, the other options, you know, it, it can be a, a lot of physicians go into creative writing, either writing a nonfiction books, such as what I did, or even writing fictional books, um, uh, with the likes of, for example, Michael Crichton or John Grisham discussing either um, uh, modern day issues uh, embedded within fictional characters and narratives and storylines, or actually just writing fiction for the broader audience. Uh, so medical writing, you can write for journals, trade publications, events, conferences, organizations, you can do guest um, posts, guest blogs. So creative writing is also another way as well. It's a little bit harder to get started, but um, it's the inherent uh, creative freedom that physicians have 
is um makes it highly enjoyable. Well, and um, let's talk. Let's let's stop a moment on the lily pad of writing. I know that for you know there are a lot of writers' workshops that physicians are putting on. I think that um, uh, Somi Docs uh, and Dr. Dana Coriel, you you and I both know her. She's doing a great job at helping to I think instill that passion in that bring out that creative thought process among so many physicians. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be about, you know, it, it could be really about anything. You could even contact your local Milton County Herald, you know, and say, I'd like to do, I'm a family physician and I'd like to talk about diabetes management in kids, or I'd like to talk about, you know, cardiology or whatever it might be, your specialty. Um, I remember I went to a writer's workshop years ago as a, as a fellow author as well, Dr. Liu, um, and having written almost 20 books myself, I know that when we look at these writer's workshops, one of the things, and this is a great tip for, for doctors listening, and, and I want you to add your additional tips as well on how to get started is just start with three bullet points and, on a certain topic, and then turn one of those bullet points into a paragraph or turn, and then you'll find that, you know what, that bullet point actually could turn into three pages. Uh, and then the next bullet point maybe turns into another page or another paragraph. And maybe it's just one paragraph per bullet point, but then you've got an article and you can, where do you go once you've beyond the journal, beyond the, 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 the screen monitor, what do I do with this stuff? You know, do I self-publish? Is Because, you know, I don't know how to do that. I'm a, I'm a doctor. I'm not a publisher. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not a, an author. I never considered myself to be that. Um, what are some of the, the next steps or tips that you might have? Kind of the process of, you know, where should I write? Because I post a blog and then I look at the, the hits and it's only gotten seven reads. And... Uh -huh. That's nice. I hope that it helped seven people or one person who visited seven times. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let you unpack that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so the, the one thing is to stay consistent and stay on a schedule. So um, I recently did a workshop where I taught physicians how to complete a book in 30 days or less. So, um, you know, my first book took nine months and then I and then my last book took uh, um, uh, a month to, to complete. So I was able to shave all that down. Uh, but one thing is stay consistent. So I recommend spending an hour or two every day, um, either journaling or writing and write one to two pages per day <clears throat> at the end of, uh, and usually for a book, a self-published book, uh, we'll talk about the, the way the publishing landscape is evolving today, but you know, for a self-published book, you know, you need 70 to 100 pages, which is adequate. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, so once you, once you have the raw material, it's how do you, it's how you package it. So do you want to use it as a guest post or do you want to send it to Kevin MD or you want to send it to um, Medscape or any of the big uh, online trade? So there's a lot of different um, options, but I, the, the reason why I like uh, self-published books is because um, it gives you um, control over the entire process. And at the end of it, it's your own brand and, it, and, it, and you have the creative ownership of the product. So that's why I like it. Um, but you can, you know, you can do collaborations. You can do um, guests. I've been approached to do a lot of guest posts for um, different blogs as well. Um, in the end, it's all about um, creating that, that piece of content. And for example, um, the white coat investors or a lot of uh, physicians on fire, a lot of these or passive income MD, all of these blogs, they started with their first guest post. And that, you know, as you stay consistent and you grow it, it continues. Um, so uh, now these days, everything is transitioning towards audio and video. So that's the way the um, landscape is evolving, but you can still do very well with, uh, with starting your blog, um, writing self-published books, but know that with that, the, um, the consumer and the um, markets are moving towards more audio and visual. So, you know, that's why people are going into online courses and a lot of people are going into um, seminars, workshops, um, digital products, that sort of thing. Um, and what's wrong? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say, um, what's interesting with the pu publishing landscape is that, you know, with the internet and with Kindle and Amazon, and in the past, you had to uh, pitch your book idea to an agent who would then send it to the publisher, and you'd, it would be a really long, drawn out, tedious process, and the odds of success were very low. So, um, and these days, that's still a viable option. Um, you know, just know that, you know, you have to have a very big, uh, well-known brand. A lot of celebrities um, do that. Um, they sometimes they use a ghostwriter. But uh, that's one way is if, you know, if you want to get into the mainstream is you have to go with a big publisher. Um, that, that being said, um, you, you'll get a significant, um, the payout is uh, much more significant. But uh, like I said, the barriers to entry are much um, greater as well. And also the, you know, the publisher takes a significant portion of, um, you know, the chunk of the profit as well. But um, with self-publishing, if, if you can use it to build your brand, augment your brand, um, and you can grow that, you can sell, uh, you can actually become uh, bigger than uh, going through a traditional publisher. Yeah, there's an author, he's written uh, probably half a dozen books, but he's been very vocal about the process and the tedious process and the, you know, the rewarding but tedious process of writing books. And I think he, he said recently in, a, in one of his podcasts about there are three stages of writing a book. And uh -huh. There's the actual, you know, idea, then there's the writing of it, then there's the selling of uh -huh. it. And that's working with a publisher that you have the idea, you pitch the idea, somebody says, yeah, that could work. Why don't you write it up, you know, and then you write it and that could take however long. And, you know, sitting down for a week, probably not going to be a great book. You know, let's be honest, you yeah. know, but, you know, <laughs> unless you've already had pages and pages and pages and files already written on this and then you assemble it and, and, and refine it within a week, you know, that's, that's fine. But definitely the selling aspect of selling your book and monetizing that book, I think the self-publishing process is, is I've, we've also, you know, be a, been a part of, of that process as well. And it definitely allows you as a physician to um, have a little bit more freedom on what you sell it for. Um, so if you wrote a gigantic book or you wrote a series and you want to bundle the series or you want to bundle three of your past books from years past plus this one, and then sell it on your own website. Or, you know, I think another thing of what a book does for physicians, and we've seen this happen again and again, is it develops a credibility. To, I mean, the, your degree has a, a lot of credibility. It, it is your brand, right? But uh -huh. when you walk into a room of your peers or non-clinicians, and you also have a book, that's going to be of interest to the people that you're now speaking to after they've heard some of your expertise. So they will then run back to your book table or run back to the table where it is being sold and purchase your book. I've seen books sell out from speakers who just got on stage for 40 minutes and <laughs> talked about what they do in medicine. And they also happen to have written a book. Um, so that's one way to help monetize that. But you know, it's in uh, our guest today is Dr. Christopher Liu. And I will say this about the, to credit Dr. Liu, um, he has over, uh, the reason we're, we're talking with him today is because he's the true essence of what a docpreneur is. He also, he not only has an MD and, you know, is a part of the medical field and the clinical field, but he also understands the entrepreneurial tendencies that physicians have and that there's nothing wrong with making money. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, you have permission. We talked about this yesterday in part one and in, uh, in another part of our series, Dr. Liu, and you're welcome to expand upon these uh, conjectures is there's, you have permission as a physician. Money is not a bad word. It's not evil. Money it provides physicians with options. It takes your kids to college. It helps you, you know, do things benevolence wise and charity wise in your community. It builds businesses, it builds people's lives. And so we want to get past the typecast and the stigma of money is bad and physicians should never talk about it or ask for it. And so you have actually 10 lines of revenue, you know, and so when one drops out, yeah, I mean, that stinks, but yeah, I've got nine other revenue streams you know, and maybe there'll be a bad year where three of my legs get knocked out 
And but the one all that I lost it two years ago comes back up a little bit, but I still got six others to lean into. So I'll let you expand upon that, but then we'll jump on to the next line of revenue as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll give you a personal example was um, in particular finishing and completing the book. That's one process, and then marketing and selling it is another. So and um, what uh, in marketing is actually the way I, I chose to do it was just partner with Amazon because that was the largest um, online platform. So people all go there. Um, and then what I did was offer different options because um, I found that a segment in a cohort that um, that buy the paperback versions are um, of the baby boomers because they like the physical copy. But a lot of the um, Kindle and the um, Kindle Unlimited is uh, is more with the um, the younger the millennial generation. So I offered it in different formats. Um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, a book, a book can sell, you know, a, a, you know, 10 bucks, 12 bucks, you know, not really a lot. And it was really interesting because, um, you know, these books would sell out at speaking engagement events, but, um, you know, after that, it would, you know, they, they would sell just minimally. But what I chose to do was um, use that to augment my brand and then um, add it as a value add to my um, online digital product. So anybody that purchased the digital course or digital product or signed up for a monthly membership um, would get the, um, would get the, uh, you know, books for free. So you can do that as a way. I think bundling really helps because that just, um, it just adds more value uh, to the brand itself. So um, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, physicians go on uh, speak, speaking tours, book tours to promote their books. Um, they can, uh, you know, partner with their local library. I know a lot of them went on the social media um, and, you know, promoted their um, book signing event and, and sold a lot of books that way. So there's a lot of um, different creative ways to, to market and, and advertise and promote your products these days. Absolutely. And paper, they, I mean, the Amazon self-publishing area, actually, once you have the word document, let's say, it will actually ask you a question, hey, do you want to convert this into Kindle? And it automatically converts it into a Kindle PDF that is readable, because if you convert it into a PDF on your own machine, uh, it might not be Kindle approved or Kindle designed, uh, so let this, let their system, their free system do that. And there, I always, I think it was a colleague or a friend of ours, uh, in the precision medicine world. She said, I learned so much from YouTube. I call it YouTube university. <laughs> uh, you know, so, you know, we've all been there. We've all looked it up. How do I change this or that, uh, or update this or that. And, um, so it is interesting to, uh, to, to learn. So, uh, you know, but again, contact Dr. Lou. Uh, we'll put all of his links above and below. Uh, he's got a number of uh, books, a number of ex wealth of expertise to lean into uh, that we would encourage you to do so. So let's let's jump on to the next one um, now that we've covered writing and publishing. And by the way, for those who are wondering, before we jump off of that quick topic, I want to share a quick statistic. I think the world needs more physician writers. And the reason I say that is because you have an expertise that we as the, the JQ public just don't. And uh, what percentage of the population has written a book, Dr. Lou? I'm, I think that as a writer, you probably come close to, to knowing this, but I'll, uh, I'll ask you anyway. So what percentage of the population has written a book? Well, I actually think... Um it's it's quite low uh it's probably i would say you know one percent maybe a little bit less that's that's my um you guess. you and i are exactly on the same page it's uh, zero zero eight six percent so a uh -huh. lot less than one percent uh, -huh. uh you know so if, if look at i mean think about that we imagine the voices that are out there and if more physicians started writing books on you know, different specialties, their areas of expertise, how much more well-informed, uh, you know, we as a population would be. Uh, so we're going to jump into the next topic with Dr. Christopher Liu. You can uh, check out uh, Dr. Liu's books there on Amazon. You can also go to his link tree. We'll put that link above and below uh, as well as uh, Dr. Liu's bio. 
but go ahead and talk to us about the next uh, second line of, of revenue. Yeah. So um, the next line of revenue is uh, is is speaking. So um, and speaking is is a really uh, fantastic and, and fun opportunity and way to uh, monetize your brand and generate additional side income. So um, you know, as physicians, I think uh, we're talking about the marketing aspect. So you know, we really as physicians, we communicate all the time. We speak to our patients, um, you know, to our colleagues. We do a lot of uh, grand rounds, lectures, CME talks, um, but we just, we don't learn how to monetize that. So, um, so public speaking is a great way you can speak for in for um, the best way to, to get started is to, you know, sp speak for free at your um, rotary club networking events and build your name and your brand that way. And uh, the next, uh, way is once you establish a brand reputation and authority you start speaking at organizations conferences events and so what it's the the advantage of being a speaker is that you have leverage so you know for example as a doctor you're treating a patient one-to-one -one. so you know you can see you know 10 to 15 patients you know 20 patients per day um as a you know as a surgeon you can do a cer only a certain number of procedures per day because you're you're limited by your time but as a speaker you can get the same message out to one person to 10 hundreds thousands millions depending on your brand scale and reach so that's the advantage is you can get the same message out with um less time and effort so uh, and you the, in that way you can impact people in a much greater and broader scale so that's why you know that's why um, I decided to retire in 2016 and, and start my consulting company so I could reach and scale uh, my message to uh, more people in, in a more efficient and effective manner. Um, I'm, seeing a, I'm seeing a theme between um, the necessary qualities and skills that are necessary to write a book, sell a book, and speak on a topic and be a speaker on that topic in multiple places, you know, and that quality is you got to market yourself. Um, take that skepticism or that fear, or that intrepidation away for the physicians and healthcare providers listening to say, you know, it's just like we talk about, it's okay to make money as a physician. You don't you need to wear this badge of honor that you're poor. Uh, you know, talk to us about marketing yourself because that's also something that that we have seen for physicians and healthcare providers, it's, it's tough to sell yourself. It, you know, you want your degree to do that for you, but huh. you know, if you don't smile and you know, you're not a really likable person and they're out there, we we've met them, you've met them uh, or her, um, you know, how, how do physicians and healthcare providers get over that, that intrepidation of that uncomfortable tension of, I just don't know if I want to sell myself in that way. It kind of feels salesy and, you know, but, but I do have something important to say. Yeah. Uh, the ironic thing is that, uh, you know, we as physicians are always marketing ourselves because when we're applying for um, residencies or applying for medical school, residency, fellowship, jobs, attendings, we're all marketing ourselves. So in one sense or, or another, we're, we're, we are selling ourselves. So, you know, if, if um, that, that's actually one of the skill sets that um, physicians need to have is self-promotion and marketing and, not, and be comfortable with that. So, um, and it's just, like I said, it's almost like, so for example, with, you know, public speaking or, um, or writing, you know, we do it all the time. We just don't know how to um, channel it into the, um, to the correct avenues to monetize it. So, and to, to monetize it, you have to be a good marketer. So um, go ahead. No, and I was saying, you don't have to be as polished as, you know, a TEDx talk, the, your favorite TEDx talk on YouTube. I mean, it. you talk every day. We, we, we encourage, and we try to, a lot of our, because I, I recruit speakers who are physician speakers every single, almost every single day of the year. And whether it's through our conferences, our live events, um, or interviews like this, or through podcasts, and I've noticed, you know, I would say 70% of most of the physicians that we talk to have a, a general comfort and uh, confidence 
that I know what to say. I know how to say it. That's not a problem. But the other, so that, that 30 to 40% is kind of out there. That's, I just don't know if I know that what I'm saying is, is powerful enough or, uh, you know, the self-confidence factor and drawing that out is so important. Um, that, but you, you've talked to people, you talk to your patients, you talk to your team every single day and uh. you add those years of talking up. You've done a lot of practice already talking and speaking and you've learned how to get through to some people with some communication strategies and tools and how and what not to say on some things. And, you know, you, people want to listen to an interesting speaker, that's for sure. And they want a dynamic speaker and, you know, there's something in it. I think, uh, you know, there, there's neuroscience data out there that says, you know, 10 seconds, 10 minutes, by the way, after about eight minutes, our brain kind of, you're not saying something interesting and got me by then, our uh -huh. brain kind of goes over to something, you know, on the stage and we stop kind of listening to you because we're focused on thinking about that thing on stage. And then we go down to a rabbit trail of, oh yeah, I got to get more groceries tonight. <laughs> you know, so we definitely want to, you know, there's definitely communication cues that can be learned and taught uh, to you as a physician listening. Um, and, but you're already, you've already talked to so many patients, thousands of words have come, millions of words have come out of your mouth, uh, over the years. So that practice should help build your confidence that you have something worthy to say. And I know that as a physician, um, you know, hiring physicians and talking to physicians and bringing them up on stage, giving them first time opportunities, bringing up seasoned professional physicians as speakers, um, you know, I think that they're, they've got so much value, so much incredible insights into it's just a matter of picking a topic that you feel as though is super unique, super dynamic, uh, that's, that's going to resonate with the audience. And it might be, you know what, I've given this talk before, but I, this is the audience. Know who the audience is first of all. And then, so I'm going to let you, I'm going to stop talking because people are probably like, stop talking. <laughs> So I'm going to let you talk and continue to expand upon uh, those ideas for, for public speaking. Um, so the uh, one thing you, you mentioned that was um, really interesting is just um, in terms of the, um, like I said, we have to learn how to organize, organize it and apply it to a different uh, channel in a different niche. So, um, one of the skills for, you know, for physicians for um, generating different streams is to realize that um, they have, there's so many different um, skills that, uh, you know, that we've, that we've developed in our career. So it's not just treating patients, but we, we know how to, um, we know how to take tests, we know how to teach, we know how to educate, we know. Um, so for example, there's physicians that focus on medical students and, um, helping them get into their, to their, um, their dream residency. And they design course curriculum and materials around that, um, aspect. So there's so many different, um, we have so many different, um, niches and skills, and it depends on how creative and how, um, uh, not innovative you are in, in, in the types of thinking. So we talked about yesterday, um, out of the box thinking, creative thinking. So start to see, and then we talked about how physicians do have value outside of just uh, patient care. And so it's up to us to really realize that and, and hone that. And then if you apply with a good um, uh, self-promotion and marketing and a good business skill set, you can generate a lot of different types of side income. Absolutely. Our guest today is Dr. Christopher Liu, and we are talking about the non-clinical ways to add revenue to your portfolio of services, um, expertise, and uh, we've covered publishing, we've covered writing, uh, we've covered books, we've covered speaking. Uh, again, you know, look for opportunities. You know, a lot of Rotary clubs, like you mentioned, are looking for, you know, they would love a doctor to come and talk about, you know, diabetes management or you know, pediatric, a pediatrician to come and talk about something or a nurse practitioner to come and talk about allergies, you know, whatever it might be, 
there is a hunger out there for healthcare insight and information. And it doesn't matter if you keep giving the same one talk 15 times, you're going to get better at it. And that's important because then that's also marketable. You can take that and say, you know what? I think the next speaker application I see come across my email or my, my desk, I'm going to apply and I'm going to see if that conference wants me to come speak. And, you know, the, the bigger the stage, you know, the more nervous you might feel, but just get up and try it. And maybe it's not for you, but maybe it is for you. And you're like, I like that. It was fun and got to meet a lot of interesting people. And man, the, the colleagues and the other faculty and speakers, they were, they were pretty cool too. And I know they were just as nervous as I was because we're all peers here. And so let's jump on to the third one with Dr. Christopher Liu, author, entrepreneur, docpreneur, as we talk, call him around here. And uh, let's talk about the third one. So another way is to um, uh, generate passive income. So through through real estate and through um, stocks and equities. So that that in a, is a skill in and of itself. So it's a process where it's not something where um, it takes any sort of um, ingenuity or creativity because it's just a, a, it's a cookie cutter process. Um, you can add your own different touches of um, personal style and um, fashion and design to those, especially when it comes to real estate. But um, in, in general, being successful at real estate is just understanding the process and, and, and getting good at it and, and automating it. So, and the advantage for physicians is that, so real estate has um, a lot of tax advantages. Um, it's, it can be used for asset protection, you know, it gets you access in proximity to a strong network, good schools, um, uh, colleagues, um, and status that, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and it's also a great uh, way for wealth generation. So I, I do advocate, you know, all, most physicians and wealthy individuals have real estate as a component of their overall wealth. So um, the, the second thing is through um, stocks and equities. So, you know, with the high earned income, you can convert a lot of that if you have a high savings rate. Um, and so I advocate a 50% or more savings rate of your earned income in at a bare minimum 20%. And then you just put it into a um, low cost index fund consistently and in dollar cost average. And over time, over 10, 20 years, that um, amount will grow and it'll compound. So the most powerful thing for physicians is to get started early because that way you, you have um, that early start in terms of time to allow those um, savings and earnings to grow. Um, so, and I'm happy to take questions from there. So, yeah, let's talk a little bit about, you know, how did you learn about the real estate investing market? If that was, you know, of interest to, cause I know that that's, that's a pretty popular one. I think for a lot of physicians, they, uh, a colleague, a peer, a friend or a family member might say, I've got, I'm thinking about investing in a duplex. Um, you know, it's, it's in this part of the city, it's close. You and I can do this, man. Um, you know, we, we've all heard those pitches from our friends and family before, right? But maybe yeah. it comes from a colleague or he's, he or she is involved in a group, a purchasing group, and, and they want you, you know, to involve you in this. And you're just like, I don't know anything about it. And if you don't know anything about it, you know, I guess that's the first question. If you don't know anything about it, should you jump in and do it just because you trust someone? Uh, so the first thing is to start with, um, self-education and financial education and literacy. So that involves just um, reading up on uh, books and, uh, and uh, there's a lot of great podcasts as well. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's very dangerous just to jump. If you don't know uh, or understand what the, the investment or what you're, or what to look out for um, it's not wise to just, to ju just jump in, especially on uh, tips uh, from family or friends. Um, so th those are kind of some of the most um, uh, riskiest types of um, investment moves. So um, the other thing is limit the amount that you're willing to lose. So, you know, if you have a certain portion, you know, you can set aside a significant portion into, but don't, you know, put, I know people, um, for example, in 2008, you know, leveraging their entire um, 
you know, houses, which, you know, which is extremely risky. So, so don't, um, don't, um, don't limit your, um, limit your losses. So uh, the best thing, the way I, I learned it was uh, just through a trial you know, by self-education. So I, I started small, so I, I didn't, if I lost, I wouldn't lose a lot and I wouldn't lose time. And then from there, um, I gained experience in education. And from there, I took my learnings and experience onto the next, next um, property, the next deal. So um, like I said, with, um, and I also, I didn't involve myself with uh, risky partnerships. I didn't, I didn't pull my money into places where I didn't understand it. So in that case, my gains might have been limited, but my losses were capped as well. So with real estate, you have to really um, learn it on your own. But like I said, if you, if you're smart and you hedge your bets and you're, and you know, um, and you're, and you're good with um, looking at the, the different things to watch out for, you'll gain that experience so that with the next deal, you'll, um, become smarter and smarter. Wonderful. And our guest today <clears throat> is Dr. Christopher Liu. He's an entrepreneur, a docpreneur, a physician, and a PhD as well. And we're talking about the different non-clinical ways to develop passive revenue. And I think we've overcome in part one uh, a lot of uh, the challenges and the opportunities that there are for physicians who have entrepreneurial tendencies, so to speak, and you want to follow those threads out and see where they might lead you. Uh, and we need more physicians leaning into, you know, alternative forms of expertise and revenue because you become an expert uh, in more ways than just your practice. You become an expert in business. In particular, if you decide to become a consultant, you know, there was one physician in North Carolina, a concierge physician, he said, you know, the, re the way that we become good at business is by knowing business. And, you know, you as a physician run a business every single day, healthcare practitioner, nurse practitioner, PA, RN, whatever it might be, you are part of a business, you're part of a team, you're running a business. And, you know, business principles don't get thrown out the window just because you have MD or NP or C of, you know, those types of titles behind your name, you're still, you know, by, by, by the taxes that you pay, you're still a business and you still have to understand how businesses work, how teams work. And I think that this is great that you're continuing to talk about this uh, and help doctors follow these threads out and help them move in and become comfortable with them and speak their language clinician to clinician to say, you know, it's okay to, to explore these threads it's okay if you make a dollar on top of a dollar that you invested. You should. Otherwise, yeah. that's not wise spending. And we want physicians to be wise with their money so that they can continue to help our communities. And, um, you know, so our guest today is Dr. Christopher Liu. Uh, as we come in for a landing, uh, what do you want doctors to think, feel, and do as we conclude our series today? So, um the overarching thing was non-clinical options. Um, I wanted to conclude with the final thought is that um, a lot of the best way to generate side income is to take a um, skill or an experience and to convert it into a knowledge product. So you're rather than trade your time for money, you're trading knowledge. So you're, so by appearing on podcasts or writing books or speaking, we're creating knowledge and we're trading knowledge. So, and then use that knowledge um, to educate people. And then that way, um, as your experience and your brand grows, you can monetize it. So that was, that would be my final thoughts for today. Wonderful. And our guest today has been Dr. Christopher Liu. He's the essence and the epitome of a great docpreneur. And that is someone, a physician who, or a healthcare practitioner who's listening is following their entrepreneurial uh, business uh, threads out and saying, you know what, I have a great idea. I think that I'm knowledgeable and I'm, ex I'm an expert at that. I want to learn more about it. There's nothing wrong with learning more about it. And you know what, there's nothing wrong with me as a physician, with me as a healthcare practitioner to maybe trade my knowledge for 
money. You know, that's okay. Yeah. It's not a bad word. It's not a bad thing. We've got to move past that typecast in healthcare. So thank you, Dr. Lou, for being with us. Uh, as we say around here, it's not about being the best doctor in the world any longer. It's about being the best doctor for the world, for your patients, and for your local community. And uh, Dr. Lou, thanks for joining us today in part three of our series and learning what options there are to develop passive revenue. Thanks so much, Mike. I enjoyed uh, participating in this series and giving and delivering a lot of value. Amen. Talk to you soon. Do 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 do